Okay, um, good day everyone. This is Henry van Rooyen from H3 Lofts. It's a privileged day today. We, um, I'm here with uh, Dr. Rob Conradi, a very well-known veterinarian uh, in the pigeon fraternity. And uh, we are here to, to, to pick his brain today and, and get a few uh, insights, professional insight into pigeon illnesses. And uh, so it's a, a great privilege for me to, to actually have this conversation with Dr. Dr. Rob, thank you very much for, uh, for having me here today. And I'm sure many other fanciers also uh, are looking forward to, to, to getting your expertise. Um, Dr. please just uh, introduce yourself shortly, where you're from, uh, how did you get involved in the, in the pigeon okay. business? Well, I, I've, had short, you know, I've had pigeons since I was 13. Um, I've, I've done the veterinary aspect of pigeons, you know, for about 48 years, you know, when I, you know, when I qualified as the vet because of my, because I had pigeons and because of my, you know, interest in pigeon diseases, I've taken it from there and, and you know, for, for 48 years now I've been, you know, been involved, you know, mainly with the, you know, sort of the testing, you know, the testing of pigeons on, uh, you know, um, doing the basic testing mainly, you know, for things like, uh, canker, candida, malaria, coxie, and, and worms. Uh, okay. After that, if we don't find an answer, we we do make um, use of laboratories and that to to help us further. But um, the basics are, are you know just the basic tests that that you do you know um, with the microscope. So. Okay. Well, thank you, doctor. We're gonna. I'm just gonna pick your brain a bit. I'm gonna sit here, um, ask you a few questions. Yeah. Um, so again, thank you very much. First question I've got is, um, I want to start at the beginning. Yeah. So obviously, when we pair up our birds, and it's time now for the breeding season, yeah. um, what do we need to do with our breeders to yeah. make sure that they're healthy and ready to actually go onto eggs? Yeah, I think, you know, I think, you know, uh, there are various ways of approaching it. Um, the, the, you know, what, what you want to, you know, right from the beginning, what, what you want to do is to try and avoid giving, you know, in much treatment while you're actually breeding. So any treatment that you, you give, um, you give before the season, you know, sort of to, to clear the birds, you know, of, of the various diseases, I'll go through them. You know, it's sort of, um, you know, firstly, you know, you know, what is happening at the moment is we're finding a lot of paratyphoid, you know, um, I think it's, it's happened, um, you know, purely because of the number of birds that we're now bringing in from overseas. 20, 30, you know, years ago, we didn't find much paratyphoid in the country, but now we're finding more and more. And and you don't want to sort of, st you know, sort of stop your breeding season to, to, to have to treat for paratyphoid, you know, and, and then continue. So what you do is you, you, you do a 10 to 14 day preventative course of, of paratyphoid treatment. The one, the, the product that works best at the moment is a, is a, um, is a mixture of Mediprim and Medicox all over the world, they, they, they product similar to that um, as one product. Here in South Africa, we haven't got a product like that as one product, so we have to mix Mediprim and Medicox. By giving a 10 to 14 day course, you, you sort of, you know, you remove that carrier state, you know, that, that, that where the pigeons could be sort of healthy, but carriers. And those bacteria are passed through through the ovaries and the testicles into the egg and into the baby. When the baby gets to about ten days old, or or so, they they start you know sort of growing very very poorly. And um, by that time, you you've already lost that round. You have to sort of break the pigeons up, give the treatments, and then start all over again. By that time, you start starting to lose time. The um, that paratyphoid treatment was something that we didn't necessarily do, you know, need to do in the past, but it's, it's become you know, um, wise to do it. If, for instance, by any chance you do have to treat for paratyphoid or E. coli or something in the season, that mixture that I mentioned can be used during the breeding season. But um, you're already sort of sitting with a, one round of babies that haven't grown well. So, you know, to, before you may tap, that, that treatment is, is, is pretty, you know, sort of has become vitally important. You also don't want to be fiddling around with deworming and uh, canker treatments and that while, you know, coxie treatments while you're breeding. Um, so it's a good idea to, to uh, 
um, treat for canker, coxie, and, and, and worms before you even sort of start mating. Um, Medpet has brought out a, a product um, called Tricure, which, which covers um, canker, coxie, and, and worms in one product with one tablet. So by giving just one tablet, you, you're actually clearing all, all of those products. And there too, you don't um, necessarily need to be sort of battling with, with um, po possible problems with worms, coxie, and, 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 and canker. So um, I think as a sort of a prevent, you know, preventative sort of um, yeah, program, that, you know, that, that is the, you know, sort of the, the, the way to go. And then, you know, then you can mate up. Um, after mating up, um, all you're really going to perhaps need to do is to, you know, sort of, you know, sort of obviously give a decent food um, the uh, you know give you know give, you know give vitamins and that as and when necessary. Um, what you use is entirely up to the fancier. Yeah? Um, later on in the season, you find the, the hens start getting a little bit. They they get the impression that they're tired, or the egg quality or the shell quality isn't what it should be. Um, and then if you add a little bit of um, sort of calcium in the form of calcium food, you know sort of. Um, every now and again. You can start early in the season, but it becomes more important later on in the season. Obviously, sort of grit, is, grit becomes vitally important. It must be in front of them all the time. A lot of chaps make a mistake that they, they'll sort of let the grit run out um, and, and then give grit, and then the pigeons you know, engorge themselves and then have to drink a lot of water and the babies get, you know, get fed water you know, rather than food. Um, so the, the, just to recap, you know, the, um, your, 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 your antibiotics and canker and that remedies, you want to sort of be giving um, before the season starts and, and, and not you know, sort of be fiddling around with it when the, when the sort of the birds are breeding. The, um, if, for instance, you do have to treat canker during the, the uh, breeding season, your best product is probably um, something like a metronid, um, um, a ranidazole product called Medizol. Um, that's completely safe for use during the during the breeding season. There are others um, that that you know you, you, you're not advisable to, to use during the breeding season. But, you know, the, if a pigeon drinks too much water, gets too much of the product in, and a lot of these canker products are toxic. They get you know the the the, the they, uh, the parents, sorry, um, you know, drink too much water, and as a result of that, the babies get more water than food. You know, so the babies grow very, very poorly. So there must be a constant supply, a constant supply of grit. It shouldn't be necessary to to deworm during the you know during the, re the breeding season, and it shouldn't be necessary to to treat for coccidiosis during the breeding season. You want to sort of try and you know avoid that tubbing. as long as you done that preventative treatment and as I said you know that that, um, um, that paratypho treatment has, has um, not been all that important in the past but it, it, you know, it is now becoming more and more important. You know. Chaps that don't do that sometimes pick up the you know the odd problem you know, with, with, with paratypho. Once you start breeding it's best not to introduce any new pigeons you know while you're breeding because they could bring in problems. So, so get decide what you're going to use for breeding for that season, and and, and keep it at that, and and, and net, try not to make any new introductions during the season. Okay, uh, Dr. Rob, yeah, thank you for that. Um, the next question I've got is uh, regarding paramixa. Yeah. Um, a lot of guys has got a different idea on paramixa. What what product to use? How often to actually um, treat paramyxa, how often to inoculate yeah. uh, the, or administer the vaccine? Um, what is the correct way yeah. to actually administer the vaccine and how often should you do it? Yeah, the, you know, the recognized sort of vaccination program, you know, is, is the first vaccination at three weeks of age. You know, the, in other words, the baby hasn't been weaned yet, but I'll come back to that later. The next vaccination is, is four weeks later, in other words, that's seven weeks. By that time, the baby's been weaned. You know. So that will bring you into, say, November, December, you know, type of thing, you know, uh, when, when all the babies have had their two vaccinations. And then you, in, in April, you know, around about April, 
you vaccinate all those babies again. In other words, they're going to be getting their third um, vaccine. And then you do all your stock birds, you know, old and young, and you do all your race birds, old and young. So the whole lot get, gets done again in April. Um, the vaccines that you use, it is unfortunately so um, that there are a lot of very poor paramyxo vaccines on the market. Um, where you can, well, uh, not even where you can, you know, it's important to use registered vaccines. You know, MedPet make the, the noblest paramyxer. It is um, admittedly uh, an expensive vaccine, but if you consider the, what it can cost you to have a bad season and what it can cost you to lose babies, it's one that's, that, that is well worth using. You don't have to use it all the time. Um, the second best one, you know, vaccines to use are your, your um, Newcastle disease vaccines. The ones like um, like AV Pro, um, Nobilis MD, and um, there's one more, I can't remember the name. But um, they generally come in, in 500 uh, mole containers, um, but they have they have been handled properly, you know, because of obviously the poultry industry is very, very fussy about the way their vaccines have been handled. And, and this is the problem that we're having with a lot of the other vaccines, is they that cold chain gets broken very, very easily. Um, that's the one problem. The other problem is that the, the, the vaccine itself is not registered. So there, there, there's no proof that that vaccine is very, you know, very effective. I don't necessarily want to mention any names in that, but there are some very, very poor paramyxo vaccines around. And so to recap, no, but it's paramyxo so is probably the, the number one, and, and it, your Newcastle disease vaccines that have been handled properly are, are, are number two. You, you, you for instance, um, can use the Nobilis as the first one, and your Newcastle disease vaccines as your second one. The, um, if you look at the SANPO regulations, they specifically say that they want a registered paramyxo vaccine, you know, um, as one of the vaccines, and, and Nobilis is the, uh, Paramix is the only one, and then they want a, a, a poultry one as well. Um, these regulations have been, you know, sort of laid down because of the demands of, of, of the poultry industry. What's also happening with Paramix is that because of all these, these um, young bird disease viruses, the birds aren't developing a, a, a decent enough immunity, and it looks as though even though you've used a decent vaccine, it looks as though in some cases, you know, in some lots, halfway through the season, the, the, the immunity seems to start to, to wane. And when we do tests on those birds, you know, if a chap's having poor performance, when we do tests on those birds, we actually find paramyxa, and, and which you, you wouldn't expect. Um, but because of this type of experience, Chaps that haven't had their birds tested are vaccinating their birds halfway through the season anyway. And chaps that are, are, are sort of battling with, um, you know, with, the, with race results for, you know, sort of um, get, get incredible improvement in many cases by actually re-vaccinating against Paramixa. And again, it doesn't seem to matter whether you use a poultry vaccine or, or a, paramyxo, a proper paramyxo vaccine. Um, earlier I said that the first vaccine must be given at three weeks. The reason why we do that is that, um, you know, from, from, from the more or less that time, three, four, five weeks, you start getting problems with circovirus. Now, circovirus acts like AIDS, where, where, where the pigeon has, you know, hasn't got the capability of, of, of developing a sort of a decent immunity to the vaccine. So we vaccinate at three weeks before circovirus hits the loft so that the bird gets a chance to develop a, a, an immunity to, to paramyxa um, before the circovirus hits the loft. Going back to the quality of our vaccines and that, I've spoken to you know, vets you know, sort of elsewhere in the world and they, <coughs> they reckon we get far more paramyxa in South Africa than we should. You know, purely because of the quality of our of our paramyxo vaccines. There's some very good imported vaccines that are brought into the country, but they, they're not brought in properly. You know, they, they, um, that cold chain does get broken. 
when when <coughs> when I get a case of paramyxa, you know, sort of diagnosed in the laboratory, or you see it with clinical signs, the first thing I ask the chap is, what vaccine did he use? And in most in most of the cases, they have used a poor quality vaccine. You know? And by that time, unfortunately, the, the the problem is already there. They we obviously advise that they vaccinate again uh, using a decent vaccine but in many cases the damage is done but the main damage done by perimixer is either in the brain or, or in the kidneys so um, some of those birds never really recover you know um, and then what happens sometimes is the fancier you know, sort of says okay now the, the second vaccine didn't work but the problem the problem is that that, that first vaccine because it was a poor vaccine has caused untold damage so that, that even the second vaccine won't you know won't correct you know because obviously the vaccine isn't a form of treatment but, but you know you, you advise that second vaccine just to make sure that that the birds have eventually a decent immunity and they may they may be they're probably birds in the loft that haven't got paramyxa yet so you still got a chance to another problem with, that we have with paramyxa and that's the the, the what happens with paramyxa is that the dead vaccines take six to eight weeks to, to work. So if you get a case of paramyxa in your loft and vaccinate immediately, it could be six to eight weeks before you actually sort of start getting, stop getting new cases sure. in a tub. So, and, and this is why, another reason why that, that three week vaccination has become, you know, vitally, vitally important. And more fortunately, more and more fanciers are, are going that way in that type of thing. Yeah. Okay. And um, I say a lot of chaps are, are sort of, you know, you hear of stories where there's a new strain of paramyxo or there's a new virus or something like that. And um, in many cases, it's purely because of what I've just said, the, the, um, um, you, know, the, the, you know, the poor quality vaccines. You know. okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Doctor. And uh, while we're on paramyxo, uh, just to give us an idea, what, what are the first kind of signs, signs yeah. that there is trouble and we are, might have a problem with yeah. paramyxa? Yeah, I see. I, I'm glad you actually caught, you know, answered that question because I actually have gotten to talk about it. But, um, you know, it, um, when paramyxa first broke out, you know, if you spoke to a chap, it was that head twisting and that, and, and a very, very watery, um, you know, dropping, you know. Because paramyxo, initially paramyxo affected the brain and the kidneys. So with the kidney involvement, they drank a lot of water, but had to obviously pass a lot of water. With the brain involvement, they got, you know, sort of, you know, sort of nervous symptoms, you know, to various degrees, sometimes very badly and sometimes just mildly. Um, so, so that was what we first saw. But paramyxo seems to have changed, and this is why, um, you know, sort of, uh, we started to maybe talk about new strains of paramyxo or or new viruses that we've come across. Um, just the other day, I, I sent a, a sample away to a lab, and you know that they found paramyxo. And the pathologist you know, reckons that what they're finding, and I mean, we've seen it in practice. Is instead of the, the sort of the nervous symptoms and the kidney um, um, problems, we're now getting sort of like quite bad diarrhea in many birds. Um, we're getting birds that are, you know, sort of dying suddenly. We're getting birds with respiratory symptoms, you know, type of thing. So what it boils down to is if you get a, especially a, a, a sick youngster, if you get a sick youngster, you know, right from the beginning, you can't rule out paramyxa. You can't say the head does because, you know, the head doesn't turn, it can't be paramyxa, or it hasn't got watery droppings, it can't be paramyxa. The paramyxo has changed so much, you know, um, that, that, that you, you name a symptom, paramyxo can, 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 can cause it. And, and um, so it is giving us a lot of trouble and, and this is why it's become more and more important to, to use your, your better quality vaccines. Okay. Um, thank you, Doc. The, so, in essence, if I hear you correctly, is from, just from the... the and the eye on, on, on just on, on the site, you can't really diagnose um, paramyxa as such because I think a lot of fanciers, like you just said, um, decide okay, I don't have paramyxa or this. Yeah. So, 
the bottom line is vaccinate yeah. um, on the third week of its, after its birth, yeah. after it's hatched, and then again seven, seven weeks. Seven weeks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And after that, in the racing season, do we vaccinate uh, again? Yeah. You know, as I said just now, the, a lot of chaps do it now as a routine because of the problems that they've heard that other fanciers mm -hmm. have had where we've made a diagnosis of paramexo halfway through the season in vaccinated pigeons. And um, so a lot of chaps are doing it halfway through the season. You know, I mean, when I was racing myself, I used to do a vaccination halfway through the season. And what, <clears throat> what you can do is you can, you know, vaccinate at that sort of, say, on a Saturday afternoon after the birds come back from the race, or you can vaccinate on Sunday. And those same birds can be, be raised the following week. Okay. And another thing with uh, giving, a, a, say, a paramexo vaccine, is that when a, a virus vaccine is, is injected, a chemical interferon you know, is released by the pigeon. And that interferon, um, we also produce it when we've got a cold and that type of thing. It helps us fight that cold and flu and that type of thing. But anyway, that, that interferon that's released by the, the pigeon system has a, a non-specific effect on, on any uh, on any virus in in the um, you know in the pigeon system, whether it be circa virus, herpes virus, or, or um, 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 <laughs> uh, or Adena virus, you know, type thing. Um, most of your cases of paramyxa are generally in your 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 younger birds because your older birds, even though they may have had poor vaccines. Somewhere along the line, they may have had a good vaccine, and somewhere along the line, they've developed an immunity by in, from contact with other pigeons. So most of your cases of paramyxo are in, in youngsters. Um, what I generally say to a person, is, especially if it's a youngster, is that um, if a youngster's off colour, um, give it a paramyxo vaccine, whether you, you've done it already or not. It, it, it may just, you know, that interferon release, you know, may just sort of help it. And and, um, um, and in many cases, the chap reports back, you know, that the, the, the paramyxo vaccine has worked. In many cases, chaps that use paramyxo vaccines through, in halfway through the season report, you know, far better results, um, sort of uh, one, one or two weeks later. You know, so. Very interesting. Uh, uh, doctor, I also want to find out, um, this is the the, the, the the what are the the illnesses we need to look after the season killers like we say yeah. um, that that fanciers really need to look out for That's and and, and yeah. be attentive to um, to make sure that the birds are healthy yeah. before when we start tossing the birds and they're under stress yeah. and when they go in the basket for the first time yeah. what are the diseases we need to look out for yeah you know, the, you know, I think, you know, obviously it's sort of, I think canker is very definitely the number one um, sort of problem that we have. You know, with the testing that I do, I go to various pet shops, you know, sort of every week. And some chaps bring their pigeons every single week, you know, for testing to be done. And in many cases, I mean, I saw it in my own lot. In many cases, you know, you, you, you treat the bird for canker. Um, seven days later, that bird's, you know, pretty clear still. Um, 14 days later, you start finding canker. So where we treat, when, sorry, when we test on a regular basis, the, um, we find that in many, many lots, for, you know, every 14 days is what needs to be done. Okay. But then on the other side, you, know, you hear of chaps that never treat against canker, you know, and they never have. So that, the birds in his lot have, have developed uh, an immunity, you know. Um, I've, I've always sort of tried to get hold of those chaps to, to actually test their birds, you know, to see if there is canker there and, and maybe it's a, a, a mild strain and that mild strain is protecting, you know. But uh, you do hear of cases where a chap doesn't treat against canker, but in, in, in most cases canker is the most important, you know. In the tests that I do at the pet shops, uh, I do a crop smear for, for canker and candida. I'll come back to candida now. And I do a blood smear for malaria. And then I do a stool sample for worms and coxie and that type of thing. Um, candida, we find, we often find an association with young bird disease, especially at the beginning of the season. I had a case um, at one of the pet shops last year where um, eight chaps came 
and of those eight chaps, seven, um, seven chaps had candida in their loft, and, and they, um, they, they had um, started training on the Federation trucks, and they, they had started picking up mild cases of young bird disease, and the candida was secondary. And then there was one chap that was clear, and he hadn't started training yet, and he hadn't, obviously the birds hadn't been in contact with other birds. Okay. So, um, so, so with the candida, you know, you often find, you know, sort of peaks every now and again, and, and it's, gen it's often in association with peaks of, of, of young bird disease. Um, but you also, you know, sort of find it after, you know, if you talk to anyone, they say it's after antibiotics and that, and that's true. Um, but what we're also finding is that we're finding it after canker treatments as well. Oh, okay. So <clears throat> what we're starting to say is that you, you treat against can candida um, once a week, regardless of whether you're doing testing or not. You know. okay. And um, that you do, you know, sort of um, Medistatin, for instance, um, well, all, most of your can uh, can candida treatments are stay in the test and they're not absorbed by the, by the bloodstream. So you can give them at any time because they're completely non-toxic because they go in one side and come out the other side, oh, but, but in the meantime, you know, killing the candida. Whereas a, something like a, an antibiotic or something, you know, to, for it to work has to be absorbed into the bloodstream, you know. Whereas um, Medistatin, for instance, works in the, uh, in the intestine where the candida is. And again, you know, it's, it's also a strange thing where I've done testing and, and, and I've done, you know, I found no, you know, nothing wrong with those birds with the test that I could do. And I sort of said to the chap, you know, sort of perhaps use, you know, sort of um, a candida treatment once a week or so and, 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 and see what happens. Because, okay, we pick up the candida in the crop, you know, when we do the test, but in the candida can sometimes be lower down, which you're not going to pick up with those tests unless you take droppings and, and send them to a laboratory. So, so in many cases when a chap is, say, given a candida treatment, even though we never found candida, he, he has started, um, he has started sort of racing better. What's also happening with candida, and, uh, and it's come perhaps as a result of young bird disease, you know, when we get young bird disease, you know, we, we sort of use antibiotics, you know, when we race badly, we use antibiotics, you know. So for that reason, um, a candida treatment should basically just be um, a routine treatment that you give on a, say, a, a, a sort of a Sunday and Monday type of thing. Um, it's added to the food. If you want to put something in the water, you can put, you know, anything into the, in the water. Okay. Because, again, because of um, the, the, the fact that we may be using more antibiotics because of the young bird disease, you know, obviously you're going to mess around with the intestinal flora and then your probiotics, you know, become more, you know, sort of become important. Okay. And they should be given either with the antibiotic or certainly after the course of antibiotics and obviously just you know, sort of stopping just before basketing. Okay. So, so most chaps use um, a candida treatment as a routine, uh, and, uh, probiotic as a routine. And then I didn't mention um, malaria, you know, um, the recognized treatment with malaria is that you give it for 10 days before the season and then um, once a week um, you know, during the season because the life cycle of the malaria is such that you, you, you're not going to necessarily blot it out completely with your 10 days of treatment so you've got to do it every sort of week you know, to, to, you know, to keep on sort of suppressing it and unfortunately what also happens is in the race baskets they're picking up pigeon flies and they could be getting a new infection you know so um so it is for this reason that that um that something like permaquin should be used for 10 days at the, before the start of the season and then after that once uh, you know once a week every day you know once a week um every week you know throughout the season just to keep that sort of suppressed you know Primaquin, you know, um, seems to be pretty safe. You can use it right up to basketing, you know, type of thing. Okay. But as I say, you know, a lot of chaps feel that, that they only do the 10-day treatment, but they don't follow up with the... And most of the cases of malaria that we find are those chaps that, that don't follow up, you know, with the once-a-week uh, once treatment. 
Uh, speaking of malaria, doctor, uh, malaria is a funny thing. It's not something that you can easily spot in your loft. No, no. Uh, so what are the symptoms that we can look out for yeah. for, for malaria? Yeah. Uh, you, know, you, you know, unless it, you've got it very, very badly, which is highly unlikely in, in most lofts because, you know, you know sort of everyone is pretty fussy about, you know, keeping their pigeons free of flies and that type of thing. Um, so the malaria that we see is always very, very mild malaria. And I must admit, you know, um, <coughs> I don't think you can really pick it up clinically, to be quite honest. You know, you can only pick it up on a, on a blood smear. You will hear us chaps saying, you know, um, or they'll tell their friend, oh, your pigeons are, are, are anemic. You know, it must be malaria. But um, I, I don't, you know, I don't believe that, 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 that <coughs> you know, the malaria ever gets so bad that, that um, you know, that, that, that you, you see it clinically. All you see is, is just, you know, sort of you start seeing poor performance. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, if the whole loft is performing badly, it's probably not malaria. But if the single pigeon that you know can fly better or used to fly better in previous seasons, those are the ones that, that possibly have picked up malaria. And, and those are the ones that aren't performing. You know. But, um, you know, every now and again, if I catch a, a feral pigeon and say euthanize it, you know, those, those pigeons are generally riddled with flies, you know, and, and if I do a post-mortem on those pigeons, you must see the damage that that malaria has actually caused in the blood vessels sure. of, of the lungs and the liver. So you, you know, you can appreciate that, that if you allow the pigeon to get bad malaria, you are start, you're going to start getting, you know, sort of, um, probably sort of, with, sort of um, well, over and above the problems with performance, you're going to start in clinical signs, even respiratory signs okay. and that type of thing. Just to be clear, doctor, um, I think there's sometimes a misconception. Malaria, pigeon malaria is actually the ca uh, caused by the pigeon fly, not the mosquito. Um, or well, we, well, yeah, we've discovered recently, well, I wouldn't say recently, but, but um, no, uh, the pigeon malaria is ca carried by the pigeon fly. But it's also carried by, by certain uh, muckies and mos mosquitoes. Sure. So, um, so you you can never say it's impossible to 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 not have malaria because you you're so fussy with your pigeon flower story. You know, you can appreciate that it's hard to to control mosquitoes in your loft. It's it's, e it's easier to control the pigeon flies in your loft in that type of thing. Okay. So you can you can never say um, you know that you you can't possibly have malaria because you don't see pigeon flies in the the um, um, two years in a row while I was still flying, you know, I was also, you know, sort of, I was fussy with, with the, the flies and that, but uh, I tested 80 of, you know, 80 race birds, which is what I usually raced, and, you know, the one year I found 10 birds with malaria at the beginning of the season, and uh, the next year I found 14, which sure. is maybe the other way around, but, but it just sort of shows you, if you look, if you look hard enough, you're going to find it. You know, a problem that we have when we make, uh, when we do the testing at the pet shops and that type of thing, is say, you know, like in my case, if I had taken three of those ten or fourteen birds to the vet, he would have said, you know, you've got three cases of malaria and your pigeons must be fraught with malaria. But I could have easier, e it was it would have been easier to take three that weren't infected. You know, without mm. me knowing, you know, no. and taking them to the vet, and and um, so what I'm getting at is that even though you're having your pigeons tested, um, don't necessarily rely on rely on those tests unless the vet has done your whole loft, which is you know highly unlikely. So malaria is something that you must always be you know sort of be be treated be careful regardless of, of, of whether you're testing or not you know, and regardless of whether you feel that you're keeping the flies under control or not. Uh, doctor, uh, the um, next question uh, that I want to touch on is actually pigeon pox. Mm. Um, because it's very prevalent now yeah. and I just want to find out firstly if a bird had pigeon pox or he's been vaccinated, is he then immune for life? Uh, or is there different strains that he can yeah. still get? Or yeah. Gen <clears throat> you know, generally they are immune for life, you know, but every now and again you may get a you may get a new strain. 
And this is why we sort of say to people, um, you know, vaccinate when you when you vaccinate against pox, um, you know, you, you vaccinate your youngsters while the, the vaccine is still fresh and that type of thing. Vaccinate your youngsters first and then what's left of the vaccine, rather just as a precaution, do do your old birds. It's gonna do no harm what's whatsoever. Um, you know, MedPet um, Medipox vaccine is tested every year, you know, sort of um, you know, um, against um, sort of possible f new field strains that have been found, you know. So generally, you know, say that that vaccine is tested every year and generally if the vaccine is applied properly, um, you, you find very, very few cases of pox, you know, unless the bird was perhaps missed or, or the vaccine wasn't done properly or, or you know, that type of thing. Yeah. And and when administering the the vaccine, what's the best way? I know some fancies like to do it on the yeah, chest yeah. and like scratch it the skin, yeah. just break the skin and then brush it. Yeah. Others do it on the leg. On what the is leg. what is the actual most yeah. effective way? Yeah, the, the most effective way is definitely on the leg. Um, you know, it's, it's been no, you know, it's been proven again and again. Um, you know, if you pluck out the, the feathers and you you rub, you know, you the, the brush that's provided. If you rub that brush over the uh, over the feather follicles, you you can you, you get a far better reaction there than, than what you're going to get here. Um, the reason being that that the, the blood supply to the feather follicles is far you know richer than the blood supply to to the um, to the skin here. Um, if you do it here, you know, the, to me there's two disadvantages. You know, for the rest of the season, you, you often feel a little bit of a lump there and it's a little bit off-putting. Uh, yeah. and, and, and another thing is, um, you know, sort of th there's a possible danger that if, for instance, you put the needle in, um, you can um, go into the muscle and not just sort of into the skin. And the skin there is very, very thin. so. So it's quite easy to get into the muscle. Now, if, for instance, you were to get a uh, sort of a, a reaction, you know, there that, that's gone into the muscle, you know, it could do that little bit of damage to the muscle. You know, okay. it's just a maybe a theoretical thing, but it's it's a it's a worry, you know. But as they um, doing it on the on the side of the leg is the recognised way of doing it. Okay, and, and that is not okay. It's a personal p opinion of mine, but it's it's. it's generally accepted, you know, like worldwide, you know, that, that, that's the way that's to go. Right, you know, purely right. because of your difference in sub blood supply between what's in the feather follicles and what's um, on the skin of the of the breast. You know. okay. Thanks, Doctor. The, other, the next question I've got is actually, there's something that, that within the next first five weeks of racing that we've picked up, and uh, the, the Afrikaans, they call it a ziekte. no one really knows. When the yeah, eyes starts yeah, watering yeah. and swelling up, and yeah. some say it's herpes, some say yeah, it's one yeah. eye cold, and we don't really know. Yeah. And it's, it's affecting the bird's performance, uh, yeah. that's so we believe. What, yeah. what exactly is that, and how can we prevent yeah, the yeah. Um And unfortunately, we, we still don't know exactly, you know, what, what it is. And I, and I don't think there's, I don't think there's a one single cause. I think there's a, there's a sort of a combination of causes, and 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 um, the combination of causes that you have in your loft isn't necessarily the same as what I have in my life. And then you get, in some lots you get cases where the, the, the one I, where, where the, the cold, the eye cold story clears in a day or two and other lots have smoulders for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. So there's definitely a, seems to be a difference in, 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 you know, from, well I wouldn't say from loft to loft, but there seems to be a difference in, difference in syndromes. I spoke to Colin Walker about it, and he's done a hell of a lot of research, you know, you know, in, you know, on on that problem, and um, he's found a, a, you know, he's found a sort of a, a, a sort of in different dots, he's found different things. You know, herpes is very definitely in a sort of a, a, a strong possibility, um, but um, he's found a lot of mycoplasma in those birds. More mycoplasma than ornithosis. You know, ornithosis is the one that you would expect. You know, sort of in most of the cases. You know, um, you know, here in South Africa, I found bacterial infections. You know, sort of in, in the eye. You know, um, so um, and then, you know, we, we I can't say that we can. We we found a, a sort of a product that will work in all cases. You know, type of thing. Um, the one that we genuinely um, sort of recommend. Um, and, and 
in many cases it works you know it works reasonably well there's one you know is tylodox which is a mixture of, of you know tylosin and and um, and doxycycline okay. and that covers your mycoplasma as well as your ornithosis which is what you know sort of colin walker um sort of um sort of felt was was the main cause well in the test that he did but as i said you know from you know, here in South Africa, it can vary from loft to loft, so it's certainly going to vary from country to country, you know, type of thing. So, um, it, it's basically got to do with the respiratory system. It's part of the respiratory problems, yeah. if you're going to, uh, when you've mentioned ornithosis and doxycycline and so forth. Yeah, that's right. So, um, it, it, it's got to do with the breathing of the actual... Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, the... It, it, uh, it, it always seems to affect performance, you know, type of thing, you know. And they say, in, in, in some lofts, you know, the, the tidal docks will work like a charm, and other lofts, it just seems to have to take its course, you know. Mm -hmm. And then you start thinking of herpes virus and that type of thing. Um, the, you know, the sort of uh, antibiotic eye ointments, um, especially the ones with cortisone, um, seem to work quite well. But the problem is, you know, it's, the cortisone is a banned substance, so you can't use it. You know, sort yeah. of um, your plain antibiotics uh, are, are ointments will certainly sort of, you know, sort of relieve the symptoms to a certain extent. But as I say, it's still, you know, this, this R problem is, it still remains a, a, a bit of a mystery. You know, you know, you know, Colin Walker did a lot of research on rotavirus and he's starting to think, you know, that, that, um, that, that even rotavirus may in some cases be, be, be playing a role, you know. Um, let us say, I don't think it's a, it's a single thing, you know, I think it's a, it's a what we call a multifactorial sort of um, syndrome, you know. Okay. And, you know, chaps talk of, of ventilation and all that sort of thing, and that possibly is true to a certain extent, but, um, you know, we, we, we seem to get it every year, you know. And, and it's one of those mystery, yeah, it's mystery it's a, illnesses, yeah. yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, it, it's a, it remains a problem, you know, and, and let's say, um, and as I said, I don't think, I don't think there's a single sort of, um, sort of cause. I think it's a, a, a whole lot of causes, you know, and it varies a, a bit, you know. Because okay. it, it definitely behaves differently in different lofts, you know, for, for some reason or other, you know. Um, it may have something to do with the ventilation or whatever, you know. But, um, okay, okay. Um, uh, lastly, I actually just want to ask you, um, is there any recommendations you can make for fanciers uh, to go to more natural kind of products that will also assist yeah. the immunity uh, that we can give the birds either yeah. in the feed or in the drink? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah the, you know, just now we were talking about circovirus. Now what circovirus does, it, it destroys the, the lymphoid system, which is a tonsil sort of system of, of, of the bird's um, body. Oh, okay. And that, once that lymphoid system has been destroyed by circovirus, you know, the pigeon's got no, you know, sort of immunity to, to anything it comes into contact with. Even, you know, the, the vaccines, as I mentioned earlier, don't, don't work as well as they should. The, um, you know, what's happening, you know, with, with all these viruses that we're getting, and what's also happening amongst the bacteria, we fi we're finding more and more resistant bacteria that, that, that don't respond to, to the, the average antibiotic that's freely available. So then, you know, you're stimulating your immunity. Um, it becomes vitally important. Now, you can stimulate, you know, like to start off with, say, probiotics. Now, what probiotics do is they they, they, they basically keep the, the intestinal tract healthy. If, for instance, the intestinal tract is healthy, the, the lymphoid system or the tonsil system of that intestine um, will obviously also be you know, healthy. Okay. The intestine is the biggest organ in the body, so you'd expect the lymphoid system to be the biggest system as well. Now, that, the, the uh, lymphocytes and antibodies and that produced by that system can be, you know, sort of sent all over the pigeon's body to, to, um, to protect the other organ systems that perhaps haven't got the same well-developed lymphoid system, you know, like the lung and the liver and that type of thing. So, by, by looking after the intestine, you, you're actually looking after the pigeon as a whole. Oh, you know? yeah. So, your, your probiotics are becoming more and more and more, you know, um, important. 
And then you, um, you know, then you get your your um, things like in MedPet, you know, they've got Medimu, you know, which which um, contains um, sort of beta glucan, which is a known um, uh, immune stimulant. Um, grapefruit seed extract, you know, also does the same thing, and there's a few other the, the ingredients that do the same thing. Um, things like uh, um, your pigeon teas. Now, all of your pigeon teas have generally got a mixture of, of, of different herbs, you know, and all those herbs stimulate immunity to a certain extent. Um, I mentioned just now your, your uh, something like a paramyxo vaccine will, will, will stimulate the, the bird's immunity. Okay. Um, aloe vera um, stimulates um, immunity. Um, strange enough, licorice. You know, <laughs> oh goodness! Um, okay. I, I've heard of fanciers that, that that actually, you know, buy that long licorice and they cut it into little slices and they they dose it as tablets. You know, my uh, goodness! And and, and um, that's been you know sort of again scientifically improved you know proved to to stimulate immunity. Um, another one is, is just plain tramisol. You know, tramisol in low doses is again you know proved to 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 stimulate immunity. I mean, you, you get a lot of other claims. Uh, vitamin C is another one, you know, but you get a lot of um, other claims where the chap says this does this does it and that does it, and, you know. Um, but you know, uh, they're not all you know proved scientifically. The ones that I've mentioned, you know, have been proved scientifically in, 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 in laboratories and that. But unfortunately, there's not the you know, there's no product that's, that's the be all and end all. Yeah, yeah. But I think the starting point is, is, is the probiotics, you know, um, just to keep the intestine healthy, you know. And, uh, but in, in human medicine, you know, probiotics are being used more and more. You know, there's always this sort of story where, where if you phone a doctor at night, he'll say, take two disprin and, and if you're not better, come and see me in the morning. You know, now the story is, you know, take two probiotic capsules and if you're not better in the morning, come, come and see me, you know. So there's definitely a swing, you know, towards, yeah. um, towards probiotics and, and, and your, you know, and, and your natural products. And I say purely because of all these funny viruses that we're dealing with and, and, and these resistant bacteria that we're dealing with. So what you do is you try and boost the pigeon's immunity so that they don't get the virus and the, or they don't get these resistant um, you know, bacteria in the first place in you know, uh, thank you doctor um, yeah I think we, we will we will end the day we can probably go on for two days straight no, we could. Uh, to go through everything um, I've certainly learned a lot today and I'm sure the viewers will will also enjoy right, well, I hope so. so thank you so much uh, I just want to how can how can the viewers uh, get hold of you if they want to have uh, pigeons tested um, yeah. or is there any can, can how can they get all yeah, the you know the local chaps um you know i'm i'm at um, cyril's pigeons and pets on sundays at ferit on on turf pets on mondays i'm at feather buddies in pretoria on on tuesdays i do testing here at home if the chap wants to come here um I, this year especially um, well last year i did you know testing in cape town i did testing in Bloemfontein, i did testing in uh Bitbunk. So I'm prepared to go, you know, um, go to these places. Um, you know, we're busy arranging a few other venues, you know, sort of, because, you know, in your outlying areas, there are not many, you know, sort of vets that, that do pigeon work, you know, so that there is a call for it. And the chaps in the smaller towns, you know, sort of seem to appreciate, you know, sort of the, the, the service yeah. type of thing. So um, I've decided that this year I'm going to, well, I'm already working on it, you know, um, going to, to perhaps more, you know, more venues, you know. I also um, do the um, the Victoria Falls race in Zimbabwe, and I go up there okay. quite often, you know. Yeah. So thank you, uh, uh, Doctor. Uh, it's really been a, a, a very enjoyable listening to you, and I've learned a lot. I think yeah. I'm going to analyze this video and make notes, yeah. and I'm sure some of the viewers will also do the same. Yeah, um, uh, I hope we can actually visit you again. I think yeah, we'll I send mean, you an I'd invite like, and we'll yeah, do a I'd, seminar. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to do something like that. You know, just to you know, just to sort of help you know where I can. I think a lot of mistakes are being made, and, and you know, a lot of chips are getting wrong advice. You know, you sort of see it on the Facebook pages and that type of thing. You know, and uh, I think. Um, yeah, I say I think any vet that does you know pigeon work you know can you know can help a lot. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's that. That is it for us. 
So tune in next week for, uh, for, for the next video uh, with more content. Subscribe, hit the bell button and you'll be notified. Uh, thank you and uh, good flying and enjoy your day.